pirate wind. Murmurs of gold, flash of saber, cutlass, dagger, sword. Roar of musket, flintlock, cannon. Tales of heroes, tales of rogues. Captain Kidd, the gentleman pirate. Bloody Morgan, the Welsh buccaneer. And Blackbeard, who claimed that only the devil knew where his treasure was hidden. On the pirate wind, teeth of gold, teeth of sharks, legends in the making. On the pirate wind, fact and fiction mingle. And it's not always easy to disentangle them, because many pirates love to spin stories about themselves. One of the most terrifying legends is that of Blackbeard, who made his base in Providence in the Bahamas from 1714 on. He held court in its taverns. Blackbeard was insatiable. He was hungry for women, for booty, and for booze. Ordinary men drank rum. Blackbeard had to mix it with something more fiery. Gunpowder. Gunpowder and rum. The original cocktail with a kick. I'm the very picture of a pirate. Blackbeard enjoyed the effect he had on his audience. In London's National Maritime Museum, there are some intriguing documents which have not been studied for 280 years. They include a number of logs of 18th century British naval officers, which show how the Royal Navy watched Blackbeard, and eventually sent two ships to ambush him in a not too gentlemanly fashion. And Blackbeard wasn't an easy victim. He used many tricks, and one trick impressed both young women and tough sailors. He went into battle with smouldering tapers in his beard. No one knew how he could manage it. Blackbeard was a loner, a real outlaw of the sea. But many pirates also worked secretly for governments. This was particularly true between 1550 and 1720, which many people see as a golden age of piracy. America had just been discovered. No country was strong enough to control the Caribbean. Spain had conquered Central and South America, and from far off Madrid, the King of Spain sent out decree after decree. To the governor of the province of Cuba, we command you to use all necessary means to protect our ports dominions and fleet against all intrusions. But the sea, the ships and the pirates weren't so easy to manage. The rest of Europe envied and feared Spain's newfound wealth. From 1510, Spanish galleons cruised across the Caribbean laden with gold and silver, jewels and jade from Mexico and Peru and were an easy target. Often, governments turned a blind eye. Any attack on Spain had its uses, especially if it could be blamed on pirates. The adventures of the pirates and buccaneers were written up by a young Dutchman called Exelkemin. He had been a pirate for eight years and sailed with Sir Henry Morgan. In action, he displayed undaunted courage. He left no stone unturned to achieve his designs. Exelkemin initially painted Morgan as a hero. But the more he worked with him, the more he came to see the dark side of Morgan. Morgan was often greedy, cruel, and yet he ended up as Governor General of Jamaica. And he died in his bed, rich, respectable, and revered. If some pirates were more bully than buccaneer, others were really clever, brave and honorable, a credit to their profession. 
Perhaps the noblest pirate of them all was Sir Francis Drake. Drake was born in 1540 on a farm on Dartmoor. When he was seven, his family had to flee the area during a violent uprising by Catholics. The Drake family were Protestants. They went to live in Kent and had to depend on the charity of relatives. It was an experience Drake never forgot. In his teens, he worked on coastal vessels, taking timber and coal to London and along the coast. Drake talked to sailors and heard many tales of America, its strange landscapes, its animals, and its great treasures. By the age of 20, he had shown enough skill to be given his first command. In 1564, Drake sailed for the West Indies in an expedition led by a relative of his, Sir John Hawkins. On one of these voyages, Drake learned a hard lesson. It added to his distrust of Catholics. At San Juan de Ulua, off the coast of Mexico, the Spaniards broke a promise of safe conduct. Hawkins' ships were attacked. The story was recorded by Richard Hacklewitt, who was a secret agent for Queen Elizabeth I. The Spanish commander had never intended to keep his promise. He ordered Hawkins' men who were ashore to be murdered and the English ships destroyed. Hawkins lost his flagship. For Francis Drake too, the journey back to England was bitter. My mistress, Queen Elizabeth, was saddened by these Spanish treacheries. Drake vowed that he would have revenge but he would not learn to hate the Spanish. For the next 30 years, Drake was to enjoy outfoxing the Spaniards in every known sea. In 1578, he set out with three ships to sail through the Straits of Magellan into the Pacific. After six hard months at sea, he gathered his men in the port of Saint Julien in Argentina. There had been many tensions during the trip across the Atlantic. As he faced his greatest challenge, only one captain before had ever navigated the Strait of Magellan. Drake gathered his men. We are all of us far from our country, our families, our friends. We're in the midst of enemies and few in numbers. Every man here is precious. He cannot be replaced for 10,000 pounds. There will be no more dissensions between sailors and gentlemen. We will all work together in harmony. Gentlemen must haul and draw with the mariners. Let us prove we are united. If there are any here who wish to go home, let them speak up now. No one chose to go home. Drake sailed through the Straits of Magellan in 16 days in good weather. Then a terrible tempest hit them. Drake lost contact with two ships. But he still went on to capture Spanish galleons off the coast of Chile, of Ecuador, of Peru, of Mexico, and of California. On the map, Drake Bays and Drake Islands succeed each other. Despite his experiences, Drake usually spared his Spanish captives, which astonished them. His crews were told to steal as much as they could and kill as little as they need. One anecdote highlights his reputation for mercy. Once in Chile, in alliance with some local Indians who hated the Spanish, Drake's men were led to a Spanish sailor who had fallen fast asleep after drinking far too much. Spanish officials were alarmed by Drake's success. 
I regret to inform your majesty that the Corsair Drake has had the impudence to steal over 250,000 ducats. He is in league with the devil. Yet, Drake managed to master his hostility to Spaniards. He became the pirate who was the perfect gentleman, the exception to the rule. Piracy also had its dark side, and no man represents that better than Blackbeard, the dark lord of the skull and crossbones. We know very little about Blackbeard's true history. His real name was probably Edward Teach, or Thatch, though another source claims he was a Scot, whose real name was Drummond. He was probably born in Bristol, in the west of England, and it's fairly sure that none of these pictures were drawn by artists who had actually met him. No one has been able to discover anything certain about his early career. The first thing we know is that in 1713, he became mate to a well-known pirate called Benjamin Hornigold, who worked out of Providence. Hornigold taught Blackbeard how to sail these intricate seas, speckled with reefs, bays and coves that were ideal cover for pirates. In the 1700s, pirates saw themselves as rebels outside society and were surprisingly democratic. Crews had the right to elect their captains. Blackbeard had a really good, by which of course is meant really bad, reputation. He could sail, shout, shoot, fight and terrify. He stood for election rather like one might stand for local sheriff. We shall see which of us can endure the longer. Once he was captain, he set out to impress his crew. This was the ordeal by sulphur. Blackbeard set fire to some and watched to see how long his shipmates could bear the stench and smoke. seem the very devil was a useful reputation to have. Every pirate flag was a symbolic message. Blackbeard made his especially fearsome. A skull wasn't enough. Blood was required to show that blood would be shed if he was resisted. Yet Blackbeard was less bloodthirsty than his flag suggests. It wasn't his violence that made his reputation. Two incidents showed him to be a daring sailor, a cut above the pirates who made their living attacking merchant ships like this. In 1716, the Royal Navy itself sent a ship to attack Blackbeard. Most pirates would have avoided HMS Scarborough. Blackbeard did not. He met her in combat and scared her off. Then, in June 1718, Blackbeard blockaded one of the most important towns in North America, Charleston. This is a reconstruction of what Charleston was like then. It was a small trading settlement with a population of about 2,000. The town grew rich on the slave trade. Blackbeard seized 11 of its leading citizens. He had six ships, the city besieged and he stopped anyone sailing in or out of an increasingly desperate port. He took hostage a rich merchant, Samuel Ragg, and his four-year-old son. The city must provide the medicines I demand. Let me go and explain to the town what you need. I'm a man of some importance. That's exactly why I want you here. Let my boy go. Be merciful. Blackbeard, be merciful. Did the devil pray. Ow. Well, do you want to go home?
For 11 days, messages went back and forth between Charleston and the ships. Blackbeard became more and more angry. Finally, the great pirate got his supply of medicine. No one was killed, but Blackbeard had humiliated a whole colony. Then, in 1718, Blackbeard decided to accept the offer of a pardon from the governor of South Carolina. This was a contract. If Blackbeard gave up piracy, he could not be brought to justice for his previous crimes. Blackbeard retired to Ocracoke on the outer banks of North Carolina, where he did a little discreet smuggling. Most of his crew left him with enough money to start new, relatively respectable lives on the mainland. But the governor of Virginia wanted Blackbeard humiliated, and so did Britain's navy. It had not forgotten the Scarborough. In 1719, Two Navy ships anchored off Ocracoke. In the rough seas, they looked small and vulnerable. Lieutenant Robert Maynard was about to play a classic trick on Blackbeard. He pretended that most of his crew had died in their initial battle. Blackbeard must have believed the ship was easy prey. The great pirate swaggered on board with only a few men. logs in the National Maritime Museum describe the fight that seemed to last hours. Maynard's own log and that of a certain Captain Gordon who was Maynard's commanding officer. Maynard knew that if he could kill Blackbeard he would have a glorious future. Maynard's log describes how Blackbeard was wounded but carried on fighting. Blackbeard's courage and stamina amazed Maynard. In the end, it took 24 cuts to kill the pirate. Maynard cut off Blackbeard's head and hung it from his mast. Some legends say that Blackbeard's skull was made into a drinking cup. But that rather sounds like one of the legends Blackbeard himself would have made up. Even those who disapproved of pirates often admired their courage. Exelkamin admired Sir Henry Morgan for the way he inspired his men. Morgan marched them across the mountains and jungles of Panama. Their goal, Panama City and its treasures. The landscape was beautiful, but the journey was harsh. Morgan's men endured terrible miseries. They had to eat leather. They ran out of water. Many died of tropical diseases. But Morgan willed them on, and they managed to capture and destroy the fabled city of Panama. To 
Today, the ruins of old Panama are much as Morgan left them. The Spanish rebuilt the city six miles further along the coast. The only treasure they saved was the great golden altar of the cathedral. The monks painted it white, and somehow Morgan's men didn't think it was valuable. It can be seen today, restored to its glory, in the church of San Jose. The psychology of pirates has always been fascinating. From 1700 on, they turned the skull and crossbones, the original Jolly Roger, into a mix of corporate logo and personal statement. Some flags harped on death. Others were more philosophical, pointing out in the hourglass the sands of time. Some trumpeted the sheer love of force. These flags highlight the fact that pirates didn't see themselves as common criminals, but as deliberate rebels. They called themselves Brethren of the Coast, who belonged to the wicked order of pirates. They were curious, even curious about themselves. Bartholomew Roberts, a Welsh captain who captured over 400 ships, still had time to think of his motives. In honest service, there is thin rations, low wages, and hard labor. In this, plenty and satiety, pleasure and ease, liberty and power. And who will not accept that all the hazard is at worst only a sour look at choking? No, a merry life and a short one shall be my motto. In their heyday, between 1550 and 1720, pirates were also curious about the world. In between looting, many of them recorded the flora and fauna of the new worlds they visited. They discovered islands and new navigational routes, especially in the Pacific. Though pirates have fascinated us for 300 years, serious naval historians have done surprisingly little research into them or into disentangling fact and fiction. Our research has uncovered some long-forgotten documents, like the logbook of Bartholomew Roberts. We also found Henry Morgan's fine silver collection he left behind in Jamaica. And less glittering, the records of many pirate trials. It's particularly strange that historians have studied piracy so little because it is still going on and menacing shipping all over the world. As in the past, pirates now thrive where no country is strong enough to control the seas. Today, that is most true in the South China Seas. There are over 7,500 islands in the Philippines. The local Coast Guard has just 300 ships, the ideal conditions for piracy. This is Manila's high security jail. And here this year, an incident took place which reveals a great deal about piracy today. This jail housed a pirate called Chenko. Despite all the high security, Chenko was machine gunned to death against this wall. family claim it was because he was about to name the surprisingly high-powered and respectable people who are secretly involved in piracy. It's a story we will return to when we have looked at how piracy has evolved from the days of ancient Greece. Pirates will continue in a moment.